got a back way out of here. I make book down the street and the cops just raided the joint. Heisted me for every nickel I had. Now, if you got the idea I'm going to front for a book, you're crazy. No, I got to make feet from the cops. Yeah, what you need is one of those horses you take bets on. Yeah, I just paid 250 bucks for this beauty. Give me a hundred and it's yours. Now, who needs a fancy watch? I'm in a bind, mister. Give me 50 and it's yours. 25. You couldn't do better with a gun. All right, already. Let me see the dough. Now, where's your back door? If you don't mind. Sub twos? Rarely, if ever. Then you must be a virtuous also, as they say. Well, yes and no. I merely make sure that my antagonists are bad chess players. How you report, Sidney? Oh, 12 watches. That comes to an interesting $325. Good hunting. That uh, waitress you pinched, Sidney. Oh, Mr. T. Well, that's how I express myself. Quite true, but this one is new here. I haven't pinched her myself yet. Well, as you say, Mr. T, good hunting. Sidney, are you beat? Oh, sure, man. Cool. Way out in Long Gonda, as they say. Little sticks, you want things, and it shows. You want things yourself, Mr. T. Money, dames, and etc. Well, you own this joint, and you work at it. You even sprouted them up. When in Rome, Sidney, do the Romans. Get these three gentlemen here tonight after closing time. Then we're ready to move? We 
are indeed. George Leland? You kidding? I never kid. But Leland's nothing but a wild young punk. He is also the best rifle shot I know. I believe it's the only thing military school taught him. Ray Miller. John Mapes, that Hamola? As you say, Sidney, that Hamola. Good, Kate. I am a gentleman. That I'll try. I'll swear I'll cuff you if you strike me again. So you may lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman. And if no gentleman, why then no arms. A herald, Kate. Oh, put me in thy books. <laughs> what is your crest? A coxcomb? A coxcomb? A coxcomb? A coxcomb? A coxcomb? Oh. You're home kind of late, Jeannie. It was a last minute rush at the drive-in. One of the girls didn't show up. Well, what difference does it make anyway? Well, I just hate to see you working so hard, that's all. Then look the other way. You know, I can do without cracks like that. I'm sorry. I know it's rough on you, honey, but once I get a break... Johnny, how much longer are we going to wait for that break? Hmm? Well, it can happen any day. Well, it hasn't happened for the last year and a half now. Look, I'm an actor. I, I've got to be seen around. Where in that big coffee house? Well, what do you expect me to do? Make a fast 70, 80 bucks a week? That's 70, 80 a week, faster than you're making now. You used to have faith in me. I used to have faith in lots of things, Johnny. <laughs> that love conquers all. That we'd have a 20-room house in Beverly Hills with a free-form swimming pool and a... I don't believe in any of it anymore. And I don't think that you really do either. It's all going to come true. It's got to. <laughs> the law of averages. That law doesn't seem to work for us, Johnny. Hey, come here. No, I'll get it. Hello? Sydney? Yeah? Bernie! Hey, it's about time you gave me a call. The producer wants to meet me? Tonight? I'll be over like a guided missile. Baby, this might be it. Well, who was it? Bernie, my agent. He set up a meeting for me tonight at 12 o'clock with a Broadway producer. <laughs> that late at night? Oh, honey, you know show business. Why, if the guy wants to meet me at midnight, so I'll meet the guy at midnight. Oh, come on. How about dinner, huh? Hey, you know the old saying? A hungry actor never gets a job. How'd you get into the act? I bailed you out. Why? Mr. Tucker wants to see you tonight after closing. What for? Doesn't he know that my mother won't give me a dime? 
Unless I straighten up and go live on that lousy ranch her third husband gave her? Mr. T just wants to make you a business proposition. Me? That's a laugh. Yeah. But Mr. Tucker don't appreciate laughing, so you just be there. Hey, Leland. Seventh rejection slip on my novel. Congratulations. You and me got to make some conversation where it's a little more quiet. And... You know what they say about my book? Uh -uh. They say it stinks. You know the funny part about it is that they're right. What do you care what they think? A year of my life went into that stinking book. Writing books is for eggheads. Mr. T's got a better idea. T? Tucker. The same. Sober up and be at the coffee house after closing tonight. There's no place else I got to go. Cats more and less acquainted? Yeah. Then we can start from scratch. Too bad we ain't got no floor show for you gents. But once Mr. T goes into his full of buster, you ain't gonna miss the dancing girls at all. Not that we ever get much romantics in these here surroundings. Sidney, I don't dig you. All this chopper music, but no tune. You know what the trouble with you beat guys is? Supposing you enlighten us. You don't talk English very good. Come on, Tucker didn't get us over here to improve our speech. Not your speech, gentlemen, but perhaps your finances. The man is talking about bread. The man is talking about money. You three gentlemen have been among my steadiest customers. I've had the opportunity of studying you closely. You're writing the great American novel? Hardly. Nor am I casting a play, nor attempting to furnish psychological guidance to a poor little rich boy. All right, all right. You've told us what you're not doing. Now, would you mind telling us what you are doing? Not at all. I'm preparing, with your cooperation, to steal a million dollars. Did uh, you say steal? Do you know anyone who's giving away a million dollars? Except Uncle Sam, of course. You're talking about some sort of crime. What's in a name? A writer of some ability once remarked, a rose by any other name would still have thorns. I need a drink. Certainly. Karen! What I want to know is why'd you pick us? Uh, 
I mean us three. Because none of you are beat, you're merely beaten. You're not detached, you're unemployed. You're not dispassionate, you're afraid, scared. Will you bring drinks for the gentleman, my dear? All right, Mr. T. In exchange for a few days of your lives, I'm offering each one of you $200,000. Money enough for you to forget you can't act, for you to stop writing bad books and, and perhaps start reading good ones, and for you to cut loose from your lovely and wandering mother so that you may go to hell in your own way. You read me? My plan is based on the interesting fact that if you take a train from Los Angeles to New York, there's a four-hour stopover in Chicago. What's so interesting about Chicago? Any town where you steal a million dollars is interesting. Before I go into details, I want to impress upon you that no one can change his mind. No one. Now, you notice I didn't put that as a question. For the simple reason that I can buy any of your deaths for X dollars. And X dollars can make any of you X permanently. This isn't what I had in mind. I don't have a liquor license and I don't believe in breaking small laws. Thank you, my dear. It's a pleasure, Mr. T. As per usual. Tomorrow you will get some presentable clothes, perhaps a shave. I'd look as though you've had money enough to travel. Now, the details of your exact duties, our meeting place in Chicago and so forth, you'll get from Sydney. Your train tickets will be picked up here tomorrow night at 8.30. Congratulations on your association with me in this magnificent undertaking. It will not only be financially rewarding, but it might also bring us fame. Anonymous, of course. Now for the details of the master plan. Johnny. The producer was the windy type. Who is he? Uh, producer? Probably has a name. Uh, Saul Houston. Never heard of him. Broadway? Well, he, uh, he's a showbacker. Heads a syndicate of investors. He said I was uh, just right for the part. Oh, Johnny, you're not kidding. Not at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm not. Why the devil can a woman ever learn a simple way of squeezing a tube of toothpaste? Well, then you did get it, huh? As far as he's concerned, yes. What does that mean? His partners, the uh, backers, uh, I've got to go to New York so they can go okay me. Oh. I see. No, it's not one of those things. Here. Take a look for yourself. He gave me an advance in cash to get me to New York. Oh, Johnny. Oh, I'm going with you. I'm only getting one ticket. I've got next month's rent. We can use that for my ticket. Oh, Johnny. <laughs> oh, I've had enough of Hollywood. Lost. Lost. The marshal has the big say-so in this man's town. Tarnished star on the breast of space. Will the law star soul at the railway siding where the big train stands? When do we get the tickets to our train? 
She's got him. Oh, good evening, Karen, darling. Cool, cool. Oh, yes, indeed, Mrs. Patterson. Way out. Never seen what Horace is going. Where's Mr. Tucker tonight, Karen, dear? Oh, if you have any complaints, I'm the proprietary till Mr. T is gone. How nice. I managed to... Now, perhaps, he won't be so critical of our generation. Oh, well, welcome. And this way, Cebu, please. Drive, I Behave yourself. Want them to accept you. Accept me. That's not the idea. Well, I accept them. Oh, Bertha Luna. What's that? Unmask, sir. Shh. That's King and Vader. Our poetry. Lauren. Oh, I see. Just a yodel, too. Horus. Tourist. From nothingness to nothingness. Go. Go, capricious Luna, on thy fool's errand. Let's us go on a fool's errand before they throw a butterfly net over it. We'll have no intolerant cracks, sir. I've got my eye on you. And vice versa. And that includes your language. The passengers on this sad train are the five senses. Well, at least we won't have to listen to that stuff anymore. I happen to like it. Well, I like old Betsy better. That rifle will make you feel any more like a man. Smell, old nostrils. Hear, old ears. Bravo, old majesty. Thank you, old square. The skull is a piece of baggage, a hat box. It has no content. The brain is missing. It's been missing all night. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Oh, King, we enjoyed it. Truly we did. From the sincere heart. I am bugged. Beyond recall. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Hail, the noble thespian has arrived. Got the tickets? No, but they're here. Tucker left them with Miss IQ before he took off for Chicago with Sydney. Well, what happened? She won't part with them till the stroke of 8.30. She takes Tucker's orders rather literally. Did I see you adulter adulterating? Oh, spiking that coke. Cough medicine. Four out of five New York doctors recommend it. Oh, really? Karen. Yes? What about the tickets? You'll get them at 8.30. But it is 8.30. It is 8.10, precisely. Karen. Yes, John. Where'd you get that pretty watch? Oh, dear Sydney sold it to me, and at a great personal loss. I'll bet. Well, it's not working. Huh? I'll never trust that Sydney again, that, that H-E-A-L. Now, would you mind giving us the tickets? It really is 8.30. Well, all right. But turn the other way. Here. Just think I might have betrayed Mr. Tucker. You'll have lots of time for that. Eventually. Mr. T? Hmm? I'm puzzled, kind of. So? It's them creeps. Creeps? I just simply don't get it. Here you form up a masterpiece. 
And then with all the expert pros available and on tap, you hire them creeps. Rank amateurs. That's exactly the crux of my plan. I excite the sleeping ambition of half-talented men, giving each of them a glimpse of the promised land, the prospect of an hour of glory to lift them out of their drab and hopeless swamp of mediocrity. Once inspired by this last chance to excel, a creep, as you so poetically put it, will go on the mission with zeal and a single purpose unmatched even by the most expert and practiced criminal. That, my good Sidney, is the alpha and omega of my theory. The beginning and the end of my psychology of directing the masterpiece of crime. Nespa? Who's he? Another creep. Pacific Challenger leaving on track five, loading at gate number two. Departure for Las Vegas, Salt Lake, Denver, Cheyenne, Lincoln, and Omaha. Connections for Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific, Des Moines, and Chicago. Please have your tickets ready. No visitors beyond the gate. Dame with John. I wouldn't know. Hello, John. I thought I recognized you. Hello, George. Introduce me and I won't tell your wife. This is my wife. Cheney, George Leland. How do you do, Mrs. Mapes? Going to Chicago? Uh, New York. Drinks are on me. No, thank you. I think I'll turn in. Why don't you have one with Mr. Leland? All right, baby. Sleep time. Excuse me. It's his wife. His wife. What's the idea of bringing her? It was her idea. Does Tucker know you brought her? I don't blame you. If it was my wife, I'd bring her along, too. She won't get in the way. She better not. Mr. Leland? Yes? May I see your ticket, please? I'm a great fan of your mother's. Understand she's coming home. Well, you probably know more about that than I do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Leland. With the booze, I still don't care for your company. What's wrong with him? Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific. 
from Joliet, Rock Island, Des Moines, Omaha, Burlington, and Colorado Springs. No business on the track kindly wait at the gate. to see about the play. Meet me back here at train time, okay? John, I, why can't I go with you? It's not a social meeting. It's what you might call a politics. You see, this man can put in a good word for me. You're not ashamed of me, are you? Oh, of course not, darling. It's just that I feel a bit self-conscious making a pitch with anyone listening in. With me listening in, John, I'm your wife. A wonderful one, too. Now, come on, be a good girl, huh? Here. Go to the pump room and have yourself a good time. Okay? Sure, I'll have a ball. Sweetheart. Good luck. Hmm? That milk ought to be quite a shock to Ray's flask. Don't fire until it hits that spot exactly. On time to the second, Mr. T. I'll leave us hope the armored car is also on time. Yes, Sidney, leave us piously hope so. Leave us also hope the take at the racetrack was up to its usual high standard. A million bucks? That's a very nice high standard. Take the car on up. Thank you. 
Some dope ran me right off the road. You fellas sure came along at the right time. Yes, we did, didn't we? I don't know where this guy came from, but he looks pretty badly hurt to me. You don't have to worry about him. Put your hands up. Lovely. Working like a clock. A million buck clock. Let's move. A little assistance, gentlemen. Oh, I think a dream. That's it. Let's move. Congratulate you, gentlemen. Well, we're five minutes behind schedule. I suggest speed. Guns go into the hole as well. Stays with me.
have exactly 30 minutes to get back to the train, gentlemen. Train number 48 leaving on track 6. Pennsylvania, the general leaving on track 6. Hi, honey. What took you so long? I made it, didn't I? Come on. Hey, Leland. I'm Jack Simpson, Chicago Morning Star. Why don't you guys leave me alone? How about your mother? There's a rumor Count Rofino gave you the air. Get out of my way. Listen, Buster. You know, you could use a little more goodwill from the press. Excuse me. Hmm? Home meeting? Uh, one fine. You don't sound very enthusiastic. Well, it's not very exciting meeting a playwright. Oh, I thought it was one of the money people. Well, he, uh, he's a rich playwright. Oh, what's his name? What is this, a cross-examination? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. It's... I guess my nerves are an edge a bit. Uh, the uh, producer's name? Uh, Saul Houston. That's the man you said you met in Hollywood. Hmm? Wasn't it? Uh, well, yes, that's right. Oh, I meant to tell you, honey, he, uh, he flew in yesterday. Can I have your keys? 11-2-2, code one. Could you get out of the car, please? 11-2-2, go to Highland Park Station. Turn around, raise your arms. 3-0-43-0-K-7. 3-0-47 to the station. Can I see your driver's license, please? Why not? It's a public document. What is he looking for? Bulls, weevils, oranges, what? There's an armored car held up. They got the best part of a million dollars. Well, if it was me, I wouldn't carry no million bucks around in no car. No? What would you do? I'd rent an armored truck. I cast my eyes to the distant shore. The sea being so big, I could not see it. It lay so far off. Oh, Lord. How is it possible to reconcile oneself to one's deeds? Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Miller, but uh, may I see your tickets? Yeah, sure. Well, you're a writer, eh? If I could just sit down all the true-to-life things I've seen, but you and me could. You are a writer, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose so. You know, everybody I've told about my memoirs says you should write a book. Same things happen to me. Ah, I wish I could type. Say, here's my card. 50-50 on all my stories, huh? Sure. Oh, thanks, Mr. Miller. 
I'll call you. Well, gee, thanks a lot. Thank you. As of this hour, the police have no leads on the armored car robbery in Chicago. We return you now to our musical program. Reverend, do you know what I think is responsible for all this crime? I haven't the most remote idea, Sister Fenshaw. The people involved. Who is it? It's me, John. Pretty, isn't it? What are you doing with the gun? Just keeping it company. What's the matter with you? Tucker warned us about guns. I need a gun to protect my beautiful money. Your money? Yeah. There's your cut. Now you get out of here. Oh, you don't think you're gonna get away with this? The only thing you can do is yell for the cops. But you won't do that. Not with your beautiful wife. That Leland boy anywhere. Probably drinking his dinner. Oh, Hattie, you know very well it's not drinking that got him into the papers. It's other things. Right. Reverend. Doing with that. I just had a fight with George. I had to slug him. Thieves falling out? He wanted to keep all the money for himself. I don't want it here. What about your compartment? And have Jeannie find it? I don't want it here. What would you suggest? We call the conductor and have him keep it for us? Come on. We've got to talk some sense into George. Make a lousy criminal. One thing, you put a bullet through his brain. All I did was hit him. That's your story. I didn't use a gun. Here's the one I took from him. Take a look for yourself. Suicide. Except that note's typewritten. And I've got a gun. You know whose typewriter that was written on? Mine. The E on my typewriter prints lower than the rest of the letters. Let's get out of here. Yeah. No! He could trace that note to me. He's tried committing suicide before. You could get rid of your typewriter. That would mean that only you and I know that it was murder. You're forgetting someone else. Who? The murderer. <laughs> I quite agree with you, Sister Fenshaw. Mine, too, is a small town. Yet somehow in such Arcadian surroundings, sin doesn't seem to be quite so simple. How true, how true. <laughs> Those 
those two men look as though they'd just seen a ghost. How many men are afraid of ghosts who are not afraid of the All High? You put that very beautifully, Reverend. Thank you. I think I'd better get back to Jeannie before she starts worrying. I'll get rid of the typewriter. Clever, Mr. Miller. A wise precaution on your part. Who are you? I'm the Reverend Basil Cuttingham. Or should I say the very Reverend? You're Tucker. I'm the Reverend Basil Cuttingham of Pembroke, New Hampshire. I should have known you'd never let that money get too far away from you. You're the one who killed George. One less share to disperse. And now, Mr. Miller, there'll be still another share less. You don't have to kill me. I ain't want any of your damn money! Conductor? Yes, ma'am. Are we on time? Yes, we are. We hate to be late. Well, so do we. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some work to do. I think lateness is a defect in a person's character. This train is never late. Good night. He's a disgrace to the uniform. The air conditioning on this train is splendid, but there's nothing like God's own air to breathe. Well, maybe so, Reverend, but it's against regulations. Regulations against breathing? You will have your little joke, eh, Reverend? <laughs> good night, Reverend. And good night to you, sir. Trusting people. An unlocked door. What do you want? Is always an invitation to a minister of the gospel. Well, thank you. But we don't need a minister. A man of the cloth is important only because he brings with him the words of the prophets of old. Well, this is hardly the time for a sermon, Reverend. Tucker, did you say? Cuttingham. There is a vague similarity in the sound. As for the time, the psalmist tells us that a thousand years are but as yesterday when it is past. They watch in the night. You should know all about the watches. Possibly. I'm sure Reverend Cunningham has a reason for coming to see us. Thank you, my dear, I have. I observed you earlier on the train, young, loving, with your lives before you, so long as you did not lust for power and gold. I have no objections to money. Would you kill for it? <laughs> of course he wouldn't. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? As for the rest, I think you'll agree with me in this late hour that silence is golden. <laughs> or was. The door swung open and I saw him lying there. Madam, would you please go back to your compartment? We could be witnesses. Ladies, please. You should have kept the door shut. How do I know they're going to be wandering around? Well, see that no one else comes in. Yes, sir.
shocking. Utterly shocking. Well, he tried it before. This time he made it. Tried what before? Suicide. What makes you think it was suicide? Well, what else would it be? Murder. Why do you say that? This note is typewritten. Well? Where's the typewriter? How well do you know him, Johnny? Oh. Leland boy. Casually, what? Oh, this has been a funny trip. Well, I haven't been splitting my sides. I didn't mean it that way. What are you doing? Why, getting a cigarette. Johnny. Yeah. Where did you get all that money? Stage money. train to Newark in the morning. A sound idea. Uh, one more thing. One of the passengers is missing. Indeed? Who? That writer in compartment D. The fellow I gave all my stories to. You must have had a very urgent reason to jump from a speeding train, don't you think? A very good reason. Which was? His typewriter. Cheney. Yes. About that money. What about it, Johnny? I've been lying to you. Where did you get it? From the Chicago robbery. Steal it. Oh, Johnny, no. You seem to be the answer to everything. And I wanted to give you everything. No, Johnny. Cheney, George Leland didn't commit suicide. I might have had the guts to go through with the robbery, but I can't take murder. I'm going with you, Johnny. All the way. Where's the body? My name's John Mapes. I've got something to tell the police. Let him in, Pat. George Leland didn't commit suicide. We know that. You trying to confess his murder? No, sir. But the both of us were involved in the Chicago armored car robbery. Aren't you having delusions of grandeur? I know where the money is. Yeah? Well, why this sudden urge to tell all, Mr. Mapes? Because I've been a fool. All right. Show me. You 
your wife? Yes, sir. Okay. <sighs> Newark. I'd know it anywhere. And thus did mighty Samson overcome the Philistine. Here's your money. Who do you think you're kidding? Well, that's where we hid the money. Yeah? And where did you hide the killer? Tucker! There's your killer! Open up, Mapes. Open the door.
Because of my darling, darling boy. I've come home to be a real mother to him. I must confess I've neglected him. But now, now the curtain rises on a bright new horizon. A new and lovely life for just the two of us. I've realized that above all things, I'm a mother. And you may quote me on that. Well, thank you, Miss Leo. One more, please, Miss Leo. 